I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles, please, and go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm sure we've all watched around us what uh, seems to be uh, just a, an incredible uh, tension and uh, division in society. I don't think it's actually just uh, in, in our culture. I mean, there's stuff happening all over the globe. Um, at the, you know, in some senses, what maybe perhaps is, uh, is a little bit of a flavor to it that's stronger now is the us versus them mindset. Everybody categorizes into groups, uh, whether you color code them or or alphabetize them, but basically, uh, you're my team and the other team, and and a significant amount of that, and and it seems uh, that when that becomes rampant, it always spirals downward, right? Because you 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 basically have the us side keep subdividing, <laughs> and the th- the the them side is actually an us side, right? I mean, they're 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 us, and they keep subdividing, and so basically just sort of fractions, uh, you know, fractures outward, and and keeps pressing uh, in that, and and probably sometimes it does that because uh, inevitably some of the us prove to be them, right? You have people who form an alliance because of a common enemy sometimes mistakenly think that they're actually all on the same side, right? The old line is, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, which is not really a very long way to build friends because sooner or later the subdividing happens about it. And so, so what can happen in the midst of that is because you thought they were us and now they don't seem like us is you actually start to potentially just become spiraling down with a mindset that is marked by by distrust, right, and division. Because the line just keeps on moving as to where the us is. And and it eventually just starts to disintegrate everything around you because of that. And, and I think uh, that's not actually a modern problem. Right? It's been a problem for as long as humans have been around. And, and in some ways, I think among religious people, it's a problem because Satan thrives on chaos. Right? He loves division. So, so he loves to actually throw into the midst of actual necessary division, unnecessary divisions, right? Because that's the, the tension, is there really are points where division should happen. But if you can get people into hyper mode, then you actually can cause all kinds of problems, one of which would be to, to, to sort of cause people to stop thinking that there is a distinction that needs to be made. I mean, just the, the fog is where he thrives. And, and so it can be, for us, challenging, right? It, it's hard at times. And, and don't get, like, I just, I'm dismissing all of the stuff out there that's political, medical, whatever else, sport. I mean, anything, us, them, out there. Let's move it all into the... Those who hold the truth and those who are, are subverting the truth, right? Where, where we live as followers of Christ, sometimes the problem can be is that we actually can either become naive or cynical, right? We can, we can actually start to go, well, no, we're all okay, when in fact we're not. Or nobody's okay when, in fact, God has and is at work in people. 
right? It's the, the either or option in this is not actually a healthy one for spiritual people. It actually has to be more balanced and more biblical in that. I've said before, we need to be suspicious of the flesh, yet confident in the spirit, right? That's, that's the tension. I, I don't trust my flesh, but I do trust the spirit. I don't trust your flesh, but I trust the spirit. So I've got to balance those. I've got to work through that. I have to recognize that I have to be discerning regarding teachers but absolutely dedicated to the truth. Right? Because, and, and I say that, I mean, I, I, this is not a new thing for me, right? There is nobody who's infallible as a teacher. But there is an infallible book. Right? And we live in a world that sometimes likes to make the test of truth the teacher rather than the text of Scripture. I think it was J.C. Ryle back in the 1800s said, the best of men are still men at best. Right? At some point, anyone short of God is going to be wrong about something. And when we forget that, we actually head for trouble. And it shouldn't, I mean, if you're looking for somebody who's infallible other than God, you're going to be disappointed, right? Because nobody can meet that standard. So so we have to have a heart that says, okay, this this is the world we live in. It's not always going to be clean and easy. It's, in fact, going to be a rough ride until Jesus comes back. And in the middle of that, we can have confidence that God has given us the truth that we need. So we don't go to despair, we pursue discernment. And that's what Paul's telling Timothy. He's he's in the middle of a a difficult situation in the city of Ephesus where the, the congregation of God's people has been infiltrated by false teachers, and Timothy is sent to try and challenge that and confront that. And apparently it's not happening quickly, right? Because this is Second Timothy. And it wasn't like an email from Paul. So this is Paul writing a letter, Timothy taking actions to do something about it, and it's still going on, and Paul writes a second letter and is saying, listen, don't, don't let this stuff spread like gangrene, right? You need to work hard to be approved to God, handling the Word of God accurately, realizing that there are other things happening. And so Timothy is told to just be steadfast on the truth, very graciously gentle and kind toward those who are being affected by the false teachers, because Paul is telling Timothy, you need to just keep teaching the truth. Perhaps God will grant them repentance. So, So don't drop into a mindset that is ready to obliterate everybody who opposes you. Keep telling the truth to them. Keep teaching the truth to them. Because you want to see people rescued. You want to see repentance happen. That's your, you're the Lord's servant pursuing the Lord's goals on this issue. Now Paul wants to sort of buffer and help Timothy to be sustained in the midst of it. And he writes a passage that in some senses could come across as sort of a dark picture of life. Look beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, 
haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind, re rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannes and Jambres's folly was also. So here's a passage in which Paul is turning the corner from how the Lord's bondservant must serve to, to the context and reality of where he's serving. There are two commands in it and then lots of reasons why you should obey those. Look at the first part of verse 1. Realize this. Actually, it's like, know this, right? So, so you need to understand and know something. And then at the end of verse 5, avoid such men as these. So, so he says that they are to recognize what's going on and then reject those who are in this category. And then he gives explanations for why that should be the case. You can see that in the text because verse 2 starts with the word for, men will be lovers of south, right? So, so you need to recognize this because here's what it's going to be like. And then look at verse 5. Avoid such men as these, first word of verse 6, for among them, right? Here's the reason why you need to avoid them. So, so what he's really talking about this, in, in a sense, he's saying to us, he's helping us understand how to respond to the difficult times that are going to come in the last days, right? Verse 1, in the last days, difficult times will come. So, Paul, how should we respond to that? And why? Right? What's our responsibility and what are the reasons that we need to motivate us to do that? That's, that's really how the passage breaks down in it. So let's look at verses 1 through the first part of verse 5. If I could say this, is if we're going to have the right response to difficult times, then we need to anticipate them. Right? They shouldn't surprise us. They actually are announced to us in Scripture that it's coming. I mean, if we all of a sudden wake up one day and go, man, I just can't, I am just stunned beyond belief at how messed up this world is. We haven't been reading our Bibles very well, right? Because it predicted, it's, it's actually a prophecy here. Notice the language in verse 1. In the last days, difficult times will come. This, this, is, this is the statement of Scripture. I mean, in one sense, the last days actually began with the coming of Jesus. I mean, we were it's sometimes called the latter times, the, the end times, the, these last days. Uh, but there's also a future sense to it in that Paul says, will come. And so I, I, don't, think, I don't think we uh, are, are probably going to do well if we start to plant the flag and say, okay, this, I mean, we are now in the very last days and, and Jesus has got to come back, which people, in the course of my lifetime, that's happened a bunch, right? It was 76 was the first time it was going to happen. And, and then there was 88 reasons why Jesus had to come back in 1988 was a book that made its rounds. And when that missed out, they recalculated and came out with one for 89. I mean, they might be up to 20 and 21 reasons by now. I don't know. But people love to say that when we were coming up to Y2K. It was like, okay, you know, we've had six days. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. So now it must be the millennium that's going to come. All right? People love to, to peg a date. And, and the fact is that the scriptures are always telling us to be ready for the return of the Lord, because we are in the end times. 
and there will be a decline and degradation of things, right? The, the pathway of human society is not upward biblically. It's not on an ascending plateau of progress, right? It actually is marked by the kind of decline that's here. So when you look at what the scriptures teach about that, any view of the end times that sees it culminating in some kind of progressive improvement just summarily dismisses a lot of scripture. Right? It just sets it aside. The fact is that things will get worse before they get better. And, and we should just come to grips with that. Right? On the big global picture, in terms of the progress of humanity, it is consistently on a pathway of rebellion against God and, and ultimately courting the judgment of God. And why is that? That's what verses 2 and 4, actually, 2 through 4 show us, this pileup of 18 descriptions of humans. And that's, this is one of those kinds times where, ladies, men means all of us, right? It's like humanity, all right? This all men are created equal. This is like the generic one. It's people, humans, will be. And then come this descriptions of human depravity. I think it's bracketed by loves that are false. Verse 2, they will be lovers of self and lovers of money. Then if you look down the end of verse 4, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Okay, so it's almost like those are the brackets within which the rest is all filled in. They love self and mammon, and they love pleasure, not God. And from that flows uh, all the rest of this uh, vice list that's here, right? And, and I think, um, I don't think Paul, I think, I'll put it positively, what Paul is doing here is firing off a list of vices. He's not necessarily giving us a neat set of categories, right? But it's almost as if he has identified the fountain from which it flows. Lovers of self, right? And lovers of pleasure more than God. From that fountain flows all kinds of sewage, right? It, 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 it reverses the basic orientation which is supposed to be marked of human life. Love God, and from love for God flows love for others. And when God has been re removed and replaced by self, then inevitably the rest all sort of falls out. Right? It's, it's going to be out of whack entirely on that. The elevation of self uh, produces, I think, a flood of conflict and corruption. Conflict with people, you can see these in the words that are used here, uh, that, that they're treacherous, reckless, that, that they're brutal, uh, that, that that kind of conflict with other people happens because it's a corruption of the affections and that flows out into the actions. I mean, I've, I've talked about this, um, it's been a long, long time ago, so you guys probably can't remember uh, but let me just run through it again, what I think happens in the, t the scriptures say, I think this is said in Romans 1, I think what's going on here, right? The world was made by God, and so to properly live in it, you actually have to see it from God's perspective. That is, accept the existence of the true and living God, right? And, and to the degree that even cultures and, and worldviews which are wrong because they don't accept the identity of the true and living God, they still accepted some form of theistic idea. Sometimes, sometimes polytheistic, all kinds of you know, ways you can, you can modify theism, but, but there was some authority outside of human living 
which established the frame of reference. The right one would be the true and living God, because all the pretender gods actually are the creation of the creatures, right? So they're always twisted. I mean, you ever wonder why in a farming community they worshipped gods of agriculture? Or among fishermen, they worshipped the gods of the sea? Right? They're, they're actually creating deities uh, to try and worship and appease that would give them what they wanted. Right? They wanted productivity, prosperity, fertility, so they worshipped the deities that they thought could give those to them. It was the reflection of man's corrupt heart, but it still put the authority somewhere outside of themselves. But we've entered into, and, and, and this is opening up the, the fundamental window of it, we have entered into an, an age in which the rejection of God entirely leaves us with no authority outside of ourselves. There's no one to say what's right or wrong. And so when that happens, it really is the revelation of lovers of self that then pushes out into this whole sort of sewage retainer of, of vices, right? Because if you go atheism, then you're going to actually put some form of humanism into it because we're the top of the food chain, supposedly, but there's almost 7 billion of us so, so that's going to mean chaos. And so what flows out of that becomes an emphasis on the individual. Right? So now, since there's no authority to tell all of us what to do, we all become our own authority. And, and there's a, there's a, you know, 25 cent word that sort of captures it, solipsism philosophically means you don't know if anything else exists, but practically it means that the concern, there's no greater concern for you than yourself. Right? You're looking out for you because nobody else is going to do it. And when that's the case, then all of your decisions become based ethically on relativism, Right? It's, it's simply what works for me in the moment. There's no absolute right or wrong. It's simply what's in the best for me right now. Because there's no ultimate standards. There's no absolute standards. It's all relative. It becomes just the choice of individuals in any moment, and there you run to. Well, I mean, that's your truth. That's, that's not my truth. Okay, that, that works for you. That doesn't work for me. Right? I mean, that's where we live right now. It is all, all pressed down to our ability to, to rule our lives, and relativism is the dominant way in which. And the other side of the coin, I think that, that sort of individual thing splits out into one side of relativism, the other of hedonism, which is a life lived in the pursuit of pleasure. Right? It, it's, it's what makes me happy, what satisfies me. Because I don't have any obligation to make God happy or to satisfy any demands outside of. And, and yeah, I mean, I... I, I may care about people around me, but at the end of the day, if it comes down to what fulfills me, what makes me happy and satisfied, I may have to abandon all of them. Because they're not ultimate. I've got to be true to myself. I've got to love myself. And instead of being lovers of God... They become lovers of pleasure because they love self. 
right? And then you take and translate that out into the kinds of things that are happening in this text, right? Therefore, I matter most. So boastful, arrogant, conceited, right? My obligations are to myself and others uh, exist really for me. So your relationship toward parents, and probably here this is bigger than just like a child doing what the parent says. My, uh, I think you could make the case, we, we're just not used to this in cultures where like you hit a certain age and you can just like call your own shots, right? But, but chapter 5 of 1 Timothy talks about the duty of children to their parents to care for them as they get older. Right? That there's, there's, there's actually like an unending responsibility with regard to children toward parents. It may not have the same authoritative command response thing, but it certainly is a bond there in which honor is to be displayed and that honor can translate into using your resources to care for them. And one of the consistent problems confronted in the scriptures, even Jesus did, remember Matthew 15? Uh, The people there, uh, God had told uh, Israel to honor their parents and, and it was actually clearly at a point where honoring their parents meant helping provide for their needs and the Pharisees and Sadducees had come up with this cool little system where they could say about their goods, that's Korban, it's dedicated to God. So sorry, I can't help you. Right? So those were adult, adults disregarding their responsibility to their older adults. So the disobedient to parents isn't just for us to use on the little kids. <laughs> it's actually something that still applies to people like me. Right, that we have responsibilities by virtue of our commitments that we should do that. But if, at the end of the day, we're wrapped around ourselves, then, then that can easily be foregone uh, or, or, or abandoned in that regard. Look at the treacherous, reckless, right? Haters of good, I, I'm not, I don't think that's the best way to translate. It just means they don't love what is good. Right? They ought to love the things that are good, but they don't. They, they actually have an appetite for things which are not good in that regard. Without self-control, brutal, malicious gossips. The idea there is slanderous kind of things you say about people to damage them. Uh, revilers is really the word is translated blasphemy or blasphemers and uh, that doesn't mean it's only toward God because you can actually blaspheme other people by speaking those kinds of things which are evil against them. But the consistent picture here is that once you abandon God, you are essentially revealing where your heart orientation is. It's love for self, and that will spiral downward. Right? One of the key things to understand about biblical depravity is that we're not all as bad as we could be. Right? God is graciously restraining. Uh, so so we, have, we do have these common grace protections. Uh, but what we're starting to see in our culture, if I just apply it that way, is that a lot of those common grace protections are being lifted now. Right, because of the abandonment of a of a of a framework, you now actually are ending up with the kind of rampant spread of this that that we're seeing. Right, so that a culture can start to become marked by this in that regard. So we shouldn't be surprised because we're called to anticipate it because the scriptures foretold it in what we know of human depravity, right? Because this isn't the only place in Scripture that we see the window into the heart of the human rejection of God. And so at, at some point, we have to come to grips with the fact that we live in a sin-cursed world among sinners with a sinister enemy of God energizing it. Right? He, 
He is at work, Ephesians 2.1 says, to energize the works of disobedience. And, and so for us to be like, wow, what's going on? Is, is, is a little bit of a betrayal of our understanding of human depravity. Right? We should recognize that this would happen. But now look at verse 5, because here's the third thing about what we have to anticipate or be aware of, counterfeit spirituality. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. And I call it counterfeit spirituality because it's a form of godliness. And I, I think in the context, I'm going to narrow it in a little bit more as we go, but, but that's the appearance, I think, of Christianity. Right, and this is a really important part of this text because even, even as I'm explaining to you, my, uh, I think my even explanation can sometimes feed into the problem that we have is that if I go back to my us and them, is that we tend to go, well, yeah, we're over here. We're the followers of Jesus. It's all them who are like that. But that's not actually the weight of this passage. Paul is actually saying that this problem is making its way in among God's people. Right? This is a passage that's warning them about false teachers in their midst. And that's where sometimes it can be so unsettling for God's people is that they're always, or I should say they're caught off guard, is they're, you know, everyone's ready to condemn the world. But what they might miss is it's actually like, it's not out there that's the real problem. It's in here. That it's possible for people who are professing godliness to actually have the characteristics that are listed in verses 2 through 4. Right? That's the danger. right? Because notice at the end of verse 5, I'm just going to jump ahead from it, avoid such men as these. And then he describes that those are the kinds of people that are actually working their way into the church. So it's, it's not, well, the world out there is so bad. It is. But it's also the presence among those who profess godliness, like this text is talking about, but deny its power, which I think is the power to transform lives, right? The context addresses the sinful desires and choices of false teachers, right? So they are claiming a form of godliness while denying that the godliness would necessarily transform them. In other words, they're defending and justifying the kinds of things that Paul says a believer should never be a part of. That you can't actually genuinely claim godliness while clinging to ungodliness. Right? Because the power of the gospel changes people. They are, these false teachers are marked by self-love that opposes love for God and is exhibited by the wickedness outlined here. And that contradicts the power of Christ's redeeming work. So, so it, it, ought to, it ought to sober us and concern us to watch the society around us go into deeper and deeper decline. But if all we're doing is looking out the window at that and not realizing that unless we're careful here, this will be where the devil will strike. When, when those who profess godliness actually start to embrace a kind of Christianity which is not radically different than that. Right? At the root different than that, but begins to tolerate the kinds of things that the decline represents. 
right? That it's okay to love self. It's okay to love money. It's okay to love pleasure more than God. That it's okay to put your own private desires and identity ahead of God. Right? Essentially, what two through four are pointing out is probably the list of things that, that in chapter four, Paul will come back and say, in the last times, there will be people who heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Right? They'll turn away from the truth. Because Paul will say, hey, if you preach the truth, this is going to confront all of these things. But if people really want all these things, they're going to say, hey, Let's find a teacher who will tell us what we want to hear. Let's get somebody who will pat us on the back about our desires and about our self-centeredness and what we want. Let's find someone who's affirming. Let's find somebody who who builds us up and and sort of uh, makes us feel better about ourselves. I mean, I, I, I mean, I just sort of, like I viscerally react. You can tell I just started to do it, right? I will hear people who claim to be Bible-believing people who say, you know, we don't need to start the gospel with a confrontation of sin because people know they're sinners. Right? And they want to spin a gospel that starts with something positive about them. You, know, you need to show them how the gospel's the answer for them feeling better because... Because everyone lives in a world that's so messed up and broken. They've got bad uh, self-perception. Show them how the gospel answers that. And the fact that some of you may be thinking, well, isn't that true? Is why I have a visceral reaction to it. Right? Because the fact is, we have to start with the holiness of God and the sinfulness of people. I mean, Jesus didn't die on the cross to make you feel better about yourself. He died because your sins deserve death. He died because we have offended God. We have rebelled against the one true and living God, and the wages of that is death. Jesus died to rescue us from condemnation. He rescued us to reconcile us to God. He's not a pop psychologist who comes along to make you feel like you're treasure because God doesn't make junk and Jesus wouldn't have died for junk. Right? All that kind of stuff gets spun out there. But what I'd suggest to you is that that's because we've become fundamentally man-centered rather than God-centered. We, we have elevated self, even among professing Christianity, to the point where now you actually have people arguing for things which are stunning in their disobedience against the Word of God. But because of, of, of the preoccupation with self that is, that is captivated, and people want their ears tickled, and that's the danger. But they offer them a spirituality which has no power. Because right? the bottom line is, You can tell yourself positive affirmations until the cows come home. It is not going to change your fundamental nature. You're a sinner. The only thing that can change you is God's power giving you life and the presence of the Holy Spirit actually renewing you. There is hope of real change. But it is not found in self-talk. It's not found in platitudes that hang on your mirror every morning so you can give ten affirmations about life. It's found in the redemption 
that Christ provided through his death, burial, and resurrection. Any kind of godliness which leaves you just as you were is one that denies the power of it. And that is constantly, constantly threatened the church of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's been that way since the pages of Scripture, that people will come in with another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel, and they'll make, they'll make the inroads in that way. So what, in addition to anticipating this problem, should we do? The end of verse 5 says avoid. Avoid. Right? Avoid such men as these. And then comes the reason in 6 through 9. The first reason is they're dangerous, verses 6 and 7. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins led by various, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. All right. So, so they're dangerous, first of all, because they're tactics. Notice the way the text describes in verse 6. They enter in, and, and some of you may have a footnote there, they creep in. They, they worm their way into households. So the picture is of people who are deceptively working their way into the fabric of God's fellowship, the people, and beginning to work to lead people captive, right? They, they're going to find those, this text says weak, it's really silly, or probably the idea is gullible, right? Their tactics are they creep in and they capture the gullible. Now, here's the tension in our day, right? This is, the, even just to read this, I mean, it's not PC, right? But here's the thing you know. He's not, he's not talking about all women, right? He's talking about a kind of category of women. They lead weak or gullible women. So when someone tries to say the apostle Paul hated women, misogyny, they're not reading Paul well. Paul is not saying all women will be led captive, but gullible women will be. And then he's going to actually identify the things that makes them susceptible in just a moment. I mean, it'd be like if I said, that appeals to brutish men. You wouldn't conclude that appeals to all men. It appeals to brutish men. Right? It's, it's a subset of women that's the issue here. And, and so it's not, this is not misogyny, as you'll hear people say, that's the Greek word for hate and then women, right? So you ever hear the word misanthrope? It's a person who hates people. Misandry is to hate men, all right? So, so that's not what Paul's doing here. He's, he's not doing that. I mean, are, are we really prepared to deny that there are gullible women who get sucked into the traps of evil men? I mean, I hope you're not prepared to deny that. I mean, my, my dad and my father-in-law used to have great quips. Most of my dads I can't repeat in public, but my, my father-in-law would say some that I shouldn't maybe, but he had one that said this, there's no man so low that some woman and some dog wouldn't love him, right? Meaning, unfortunately, right, there, there are women who will gravitate toward bad men. I mean, we all know that. That the Bible recognizes that should not be considered a flaw in the Bible. It should actually be recognized the truthfulness of the Bible. That there are, in fact, people who are susceptible to evil men. And it warns us about that. It warns us about that. All right? Notice the reason they are targeted in verses 6 and 7. All right? They are weighed down with sins. And Paul speaks of that in the past tense. So in all probability, what's happening here is Paul's talking about the fact that they have stained consciences. They have committed sins, and those are still weighing on them. Right? They've, they've not gotten release from the guilt of that, and so their consciences, being stained by sin, make them susceptible to this false teaching. Notice it says, led on 
by various impulses. They also have a tendency, and this is present tense, right? So they are weighed down past, they are being led by sinful impulses. So, so there actually are sinful cravings and desires in their heart which make them susceptible to it, right? So the false teachers know what the appetites are and they bait the hook for them. These people are looking for something. That's why the false teachers can actually appeal to them in it. And then notice in verse 7, they, are, they have a kind of uh, curiosity which is not controlled by Scripture, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that knowledge of the truth is a reference to the gospel. Just look up to chapter 2, verse 25. The end of verse 25 may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Right? So, so they... They have a kind of spiritual curiosity that actually isn't oriented toward the Word of God, the knowledge of the truth. It's actually just in love with hearing, learning, and figuring all kinds of stuff, right? They're always after the new thing, the next thing, the better thing, the twist in the teaching. And so along come these false teachers, driven by love for self, pursuing pleasure and money, Right? And they go, hey, they work their way into the households. They begin to identify the people who seem to fit these categories and they target them and, and, and basically take them captive. They're captivated by this and they're brought into it. And the combination of these things, I think, indicate that the the false teachers are feeding, I'm going to say it bluntly, but are feeding off the goats, not the sheep. Right? Because they're, they're, they're weighed down with sins, filled with evil impulses, and haven't come to know the truth. And I think that's important to understand because the the tension, if we're going to look at this rightly, is not that all of God's people are susceptible to these things, but that there are people who haven't solidified their faith in Christ, but have come near the assembly of God's people and are where false teachers feed. They swim the shores of God's people looking for people that they can pull down and pull away. And, and that's why we have to avoid them. Notice in verse 8, there's another reason why we should avoid them. They're depraved. right? They are men of depraved mind. That is, their hearts and minds are contrary to the truth of God. They're rebels against it. Notice he says they oppose the truth. And they're rejected in regard to the faith. They, they actually don't have a hunger for the truth. They're opposed to it. And their faith is proven to be false. And, and therefore has to be rejected in that regard. It cannot be accepted in that. That's probably indication of like what Paul did in chapter one of 1 Timothy, where he, he handed two teachers over to Satan because they'd shipwreck their faith, right? When, when you identify somebody who's rejected the faith, they need to be rejected. They can't be tolerated as a teacher among God's people. What Paul does here in 8 and 9 is he refers to two men, Jannes and Jambres, easy and breezy. Those two uh, are identified in traditional literature, not in the scriptures, as the magicians who opposed Moses. Right? So they, when Moses showed up and, and began to give the signs, they were the guys who did the counterfeit through the magic and opposed it. And, and so Paul taps into that uh, traditional understanding of who these men were and said, that's what these false teachers are. And, and I think he does that for two reasons. One is he's showing that their teachings are actually a deception, 
right? It's trickery. But also that they are opposing the truth of God, which was mediated through Moses. These people are opposing the truth of God that's been given to us through the apostles. And so it, their rebellion is against God and they need to be rejected. The last statement in reason is in verse 9. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as Jannie's and Jambri's folly was also. And here's the, so, so they're dangerous, they're depraved, but also they will be defeated. And this is the part that comes back around, right? It could be like the bummer kind of message. Look at the mess this is. Look at how rotten things are. But here's where Paul finishes. They will not progress any farther because their folly will become obvious. That's why he goes to these two men, right? They seem to have momentary success, right? Moses throws down the rod, it turns into a snake, they, they do an imitation, right? Nile turns to blood, they turn a bucket to blood. Looks like they're hanging with Moses, but it didn't last very long, right? They won't actually win their folly will be exposed. So they will have limited progress and ultimate exposure because the nature of their teaching is, is false and eventually truth will win on this. So he ends with what I would consider to be an optimistic stance. So we read a passage of like, this, like this. It's a dark passage, but it should not lead to pessimism. And it shouldn't lead to cynicism, right? Pessimism would be like, oh, you know, we're done. Woe is me. We're, we're uh, the Eeyores of Christianity, right? Everything's going to be bad. It's just going to be horrible. All right, just, it's just going to be this way. That's not what it is, actually. He says, those who are opposing Jesus Christ won't make progress beyond the point that, that, that the victory will be denied them, right? They will be exposed in their folly. And, and it shouldn't produce cynicism in us, which would mean all of a sudden we go to, all right, if everything's so bad, then I don't trust anybody. Because Paul's not teaching that. He's actually telling Timothy, teach the truth, proclaim the truth, the truth will win, Right? So it's not pessimism. It's not cynicism. What I would say is it's like a realistic optimism. It's, it's realistic because it doesn't ignore the hard realities of life in a sin-cursed world under the cruel rule of Satan. It's not naive at all. It's realistic about that. It understands that and doesn't cave. So, so it's not surprised by the downgrade because the Bible warns us about that and we shouldn't be caught off guard and we shouldn't live in fear or paranoia, right? The fact that there's going to be false teachers shouldn't produce fear in me. It shouldn't produce paranoia. It should just make me prepared to hold to the truth and teach the truth. Right? It's, not, it's not in any way supposed to make us a, a, a bunch of gloomy and fearful people. It's actually intended to prepare us wisely because Jesus will win. And Jesus will rescue and sustain his faithful people. Look at verse 11. Just We'll see it at some point. But notice it says the end of verse what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Right? The end of the chapter, Paul's saying, we have the scriptures that are able to make us perfect, equipped for every good work. So, so Paul's not going, Timothy, I'm in this jail, life stinks, it's all going to end in a disaster. He's going, no, be ready. Right? Be ready, because this is, this is the pathway we're on, but... Here's the reality. The Lord will rescue you, and the Lord has given you what you need to know him and serve him. All right, so, so have your eyes open, but don't give up. 
have a kind of realistic optimism about it. And because these threats are among those who profess faith, that should, I think, chasten our tendency to hunker down as if we can hide out from the trouble. There's something always going on about believers that go, well, the world's out there so bad. If we just sort of get in our holy huddle, we'll be safe. But I I hate to break it to you, but there is no huddle that's safe. Remember what Paul said to the church at Ephesus, the elders there? There will be wolves in sheep's clothing, and there will be people who rise up from among you speaking perverse things. Right, The minute you think that because you're with the right crowd, you're safe, is the minute you're in trouble. Because even the best of men are men at best. And the authority for us is the word of God. Right? So we're always putting everything to the test of Scripture. We're holding it by that. And, and, it, and this text... When it says avoid such men, it's talking about the false teachers. So we need to be reminded that what sometimes we can do is we can turn genuine separation, right? There's the presence of false teachers, so we need to separate from them, right? That's legitimate. What we sometimes end up doing is turning that into kind of uh, an isolation from people who don't know Christ. And the scriptures never call us to that. There's not one thing in the New Testament that would tell you, avoid lost people. Doesn't say that at all. Right? It says, avoid people who claim to be believers and live like lost people. Avoid false teachers. Right? And and so what we have to guard against is actually possibly wanting just to have a comfortable place for us. But actually what that might act, uh, produce is the fact that now we turn the church into a place that exhibits our love for self. Right? We, we want our comfort. We want our pleasure. Let's have our little happy, holy huddle. And we set ourselves up actually to be led astray by people who will tickle our ears. We should, as well, when we read a text like this, make us very suspicious of those who want a big tent kind of Christianity. Just because people claim to be followers of Jesus does not mean they actually are. The test is the truth of God. In part, of how false teachers don't make further progress and Jesus guards his sheep is us all being responsible defenders of the faith. Do we have as our highest priority a commitment to the rule of Jesus Christ over his sheep through his word? Right, And, and, and I think the thing that we have to ask ourselves regularly is, when I'm making decisions about what I want and what I think about church, am I ever laying anything down in submission to the word? Right? Do I, do I ever have to go, well, I really would like this, but it's not my will, it's God's. Right? Do we ever actually bend ourselves to the word or do we think God always agrees with us? My guess is if we think God always agrees with us, then then we're putting our thoughts in charge because none of us nail it right every time. So we need to have a heart to yield to the authority of the word and therefore are guarded against the temptation to cater to our desires rather than to surrender to his will. Let's pray together, please. Mm